Good evening to you all. It's good to be with you again. And we're going to start this evening by reading Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were the seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell those people, Be ever hearing but never understanding, Be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, Make their ears dull and close their eyes, Otherwise they might see with their eyes, Hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted, and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away, and the land is utterly forsaken, and though a tenth remain in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. I'm told, or from what I've read, um, the Hebrew language is a very limited language. It has relatively few words compared to English. And so one of the, the issues is that they... They don't express things in the same way. Um, we would have said, you know, we have a hot summer, and today you might say it was hot, hot, and tomorrow it's going to be hot, hot, hot. <laughs> and so this, this uh, call of the seraphim represents not just a holy God, not even a very holy God, but an ultimate, an extremely holy God. One who is above and beyond our understanding. And it's interesting that that phrase also occurs in, in Revelation. That again, that vision that John has, uh, he sees the seraphim. And they're still in his vision calling holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Heather's now going to come and bring us our reading. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. 
Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. <clears throat> As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that, that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Oh, When Heather and I get home Sunday lunchtime uh, after the morning service at Hyde Heath, we tend to put the TV on and watch the news and songs of praise. Sadly, songs of praise is not what it used to be. Occasionally, but rarely, you get a real Christian witness. Too often, though, the program is bland and meaningless. Too often, the witness, even of the uh, the Christian witness of, of the hymns has been emasculated by editing out the verses that have real Christian content and challenge. On this programme, people often talk about faith. But they do it in such a way that you're left wondering, faith in what? Recently, the broadcast was from the Baptist Union Assembly, and the emphasis seemed to be on meeting people, and on arts and crafts activity. God was hardly mentioned at all, 
No one spoke about the Bible as the source of learning and teaching. And it was about what people learned through their experiences. And that is, seems to be fairly typical of the program. It's easy to be critical. But one is left wondering about the way that the Christian faith is represented by the BBC. Some people were delighted with the sermon about, uh, that was given during the Thanksgiving service at the Queen's Jubilee. But if you listened to the BBC News afterwards, you would only have picked up the bit about the Queen's love of horse racing and horses. So what of the Christian faith? Yes, we are saved by faith. You probably all know Ephesians 2 verse 8 very well. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So God's mercy and love is shown in the gift of faith that enables us to confess our sins to him and to trust in him for salvation. And surely we all know that the death of the Lord Jesus was the means by which our sins are forgiven. It was the payment of the penalty for our sin so that we would not have to endure eternal separation from God. And the resurrection of the Lord Jesus brings that sure and certain hope that we shall one day rise from death to eternal life in God's presence. But Ephesians 2 verse 9 emphasises this salvation by faith alone. Paul goes on, we are saved by faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. Salvation is from God. We only contribute our sin, it has sometimes been said. We cannot buy our salvation by any good works. Isaiah makes this clear too in Isaiah 64 verse 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. <coughs> we all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind our sins sweep us away. Yet Paul insists that by the gift of faith we become God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared for us to do which God had prepared in advance for us to do and James too is emphatic what good is it my brothers and sisters if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds can such faith save them that's James 2 verse 14 and he then goes on in verses 17 and 18. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your, your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. So simply to talk about faith is meaningless if it is not demonstrated by a changed life. Telling me about your experiences and how they have deepened your faith is of little value. I need to know that when trials and difficulties come to me, that God will be there for me also. And that is why the Bible is so important. It is God's word to me. It tells me that he is the author and finisher, the pioneer and perfecter of my faith. Hebrews 12, 2. So faith does not stand alone. Faith is demonstrated by the way I live as a Christian. So how should I live day by day? And if you are a Christian, how should faith affect your life? Yes, as Paul says, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so Peter calls in 1 Peter 14 uh, to 17, similarly emphasizes that that is what, what we do, the way that we live, that it is the important thing. Why? Because it is the demonstrator of our faith. 
of our calling. This is what he says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. And in verses 18 and 19, the emphasis, he emphasises the reason that we should live in this way. For you know that it is not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And this also gives a clue as to what it means to be holy. Jesus was without blemish or defect. This is in such strong contrast to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance, in our empty way of life handed down to us from our ancestors, to quote Peter. Years ago, I was on a course designed to help those who were taking up uh, leadership in leadership roles within churches. People from Sunday school teachers to trainee pastors. I was struck by one session that we did on preaching. The presenter started with a big, clean whiteboard and he asked the question, what ideas, topics, stories do we get from the Bible? I think we started with God. And that was broken down then into Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Someone raised the topic of creation. Someone raised the topic of sin. We, uh, um, we then went on to, to salvation, eternity, the story of the Jewish nation, the history of the early church, and so on. Very soon, the presenter had filled his whiteboard. And then he said this to us. If you've, ever, if you've ever wondered how you will find enough to preach on in the years to come, don't worry. In 15 minutes, we have filled this board with topics. Some of them are really big topics that you'll take weeks to, de to, scratch, uh, to deal with. We have only scratched the surface of what the Bible contains. You are not going to run out of topics to preach about. And holiness is one of those big topics. It's such an enormous topic that we could go on and talk about it for weeks. I suppose Isaiah 6 is one of those passages that we automatically think about when we think about holiness because it emphasises the holiness of God. The seraphim cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And we've read from Peter how we are called to live holy lives because God is holy. Be holy, he says, because I am holy. That's an interesting quotation because it comes from Leviticus chapter 11, which is a chapter about clean and unclean foods. And yet in Acts chapter 10, it is Peter who is given a vision of all kinds of clean and unclean animals, and he's told to rise, get, get up, Peter, kill and eat. The point that God was making to Peter was that the old distinctions between clean and unclean, between Jew and Gentile, were being abolished. Yet exact, this is exactly the, uh, the passage that Peter refers to, the one that defines clean and unclean. So what is going on? How are we to define holiness if it is not being about clean, about being pure and distancing ourselves from the things that contaminate us? How are we to be holy? And in one sense, this dilemma reoccurs when you go to chapter 2. Peter reminds his readers, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
God's special possession. Where else do we find these terms? Where is this a quotation from? The answer is back in Exodus chapter 19, where God declares that the Israelites are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But this is in the context of giving the law. So is holiness about keeping rules and regulations? No, because as we've seen, the old ceremonial law was being abolished. Jesus fulfilled the law, and through his death and resurrection, he broke the bonds of the law that constrained us. Think, for example, of the big debate of the first Christian council, the one recorded for us in Acts chapter 15. Some Christian Pharisees came to the church in Antioch. They wanted to enforce the Old Testament legal system. They said the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. They wanted an outwardly visible Old Testament holiness. And Peter argued against this. He reminded the Christian council that why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. And Peter's argument wins the day. So the Gentile believers are urged to avoid things that are associated with pagan worship, food offered to idols, sexual immorality, and things related to blood. What the Christian council is saying is it's not a matter of rules. It's a matter of having an inward holiness that, does not, that is not contaminated by the old way of life, by the world around us. Think back to what we read in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah sees an amazing vision of God seated on his throne in heaven. The sight makes him realise his own sinfulness. So how is this situation resolved? Does an angel come and bring him a rule book and tell him to keep the rules? No. A burning coal is brought from the altar and it is used to purify Isaiah. It cleanses him so that he is now able to speak for God to God's people. Isaiah is not purified by keeping rules, just as we are not saved by keeping rules. Isaiah is purified by the grace of God, by the fire of God's own altar. And he is then uh, commissioned to serve by proclaiming the truth of God. And we too are purified by the sacrifice of Jesus' own blood, offered on the altar in heaven itself. We have already noted that Peter points back to God's calling of his people to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, from Exodus chapter 19. The passage highlights the similarities to the Christian with the Old Testament people. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. God chose Abraham and declared that he would make of him a people through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. God did not choose them, because they were a great nation. Deuteronomy 7.7 7 highlights this. Moses reminds the people that they were chosen not because they were numerous, because they were a small nation. They were, not, they were chosen because of God's love for them. Up until the time that God led them out of Egypt, they were not a nation together. They went into Egypt as an extended family, riven with strife. 
They lived in Egypt as a separate people group, oppressed and dispersed and disunited. But God rescued them as a single nation, united through their persecution as slaves. They were coming out as a nation to worship together as a united people of God. Bound together by their experiences in the desert, they fought together to clear the land that the Lord granted to them. United initially under one leader, worshipping together in one place, celebrating the same events of their common history, their common salvation from the darkness of slavery in Egypt. Similarly, Christians are called out of the world by God. There is nothing good about us that God should choose us. It is by his sovereign will that we are redeemed because of his great love for us. Until we are brought into God's kingdom, there is nothing to unite us. We too are a disparate people. But when we become Christians, we become part of the same family, brothers and sisters together. We become a holy nation called to walk in the light of the truth of God's word, to spread the light of the gospel to the dark world around us, to be like a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden, that is seen by all the world around us. We have each received mercy instead of the judgment that our sins deserve. We have these things in common. We are children of the King of Kings, a royal priesthood. And as you go through Exodus, we find that the new nation of Israel is called to live in a different way to that of the nations surrounding them. Their worship is to be different. They are not to worship the multiple idols uh, uh, representing the, the deities that uh, the Canaanites worshipped that needed to be appeased or stimulated into action. Israel's lives are to be marked by a dependence upon a gracious God. They are to respect their God. And because their neighbour is equal to them and is also God's servant, their brother, they are to care for their neighbour. But even though their God is a gracious God, they must treat him with reverent fear. They must recognise that they are made in God's image. They are not worshipping a God who is made in their image. Instead, they are made in his image. God is separate, different, pure. The people's sins, their failures, are an offence to his nature and consequently must be atoned for. So sin creates a barrier and therefore their approach to God must be controlled in such a way as to appease God's anger. Thus God chooses a tribe of the nation to act as intermediaries between his people and such a holy God. The tribe of Levi was to provide the priesthood who were those intermediaries between God and man. They were to offer the sacrifices to acknowledge the sin and their indebtedness before such a holy God. They were to represent God, uh, to represent the people to God. The rules and the regulations of the Levites and the priests in particular make interesting reading because they highlight how this tribe, how the priests themselves were to live a separate life from the rest of the people of their nation. They were to live among the people, but they were to be separate from them. They were not to have land like the other people. God himself would be their special portion and inheritance. They were to obtain their living from the gifts of God's people. The clothing of the priests was to be distinctive. It was to express their closeness to God by being of the same colours as the decor of the temple where God dwelt among his people. Sin spoke of death. 
so the priests must avoid contact with the dead. And yet their whole service involved the slaughter of the sacrifices, the offering of blood that would have contaminated ordinary people. So the priests not only represent the people to God, they represent God to the people. Their separation from the way of the life of the people, their distinctiveness was designed to show the holiness of God to the people. They truly were to be intermediaries, separated from the people, but sharing their lives to show God's distinction, but also separate from the people so as to be separate from their sinfulness. Yet as ordinary people, they still needed to offer sacrifices for their own sins, to purify themselves so they could appear in the presence of God in his temple. In the same way, we are people who are separate from the people of this world. We are not to be taken out of this world when we are saved and redeemed. No, we are left here to be witnesses of God's love and goodness. We are to be like the Old Testament priests, separate, distinct, so that we can be seen as different from this, uh, from this fallen world. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul uses the illustration of a trumpet sounding an indistinct note in relation to people speaking in tongues. His argument is that speaking in a foreign language without an interpretation does not edify, build up or strengthen God's people. And therefore, it is better to speak intelligibly to people about God. We can broaden that illustration if the life that we live is not clear and distinct and intelligible as a life lived for Christ, then we are poor and ineffective witnesses to those around about us. How does our life speak about Christ if it is no different from the people of the world around us? And in such a case, even if we were to proclaim the gospel, how will the words that we, may, that we say make a difference if they are not supported by the way that we live. That is why Jesus spoke against the Pharisees. They lived a separate and distinct life, but it was not a life of holiness, but a holier-than-thou life. Their life was based on rules that they had invented. In one sense, their rules were well-intentioned, they were a mean, meant to be a guide to living a truly holy life. But it was the rules that became the objective, not the holy life. And so it was that the rules were important, more important than holiness. And then to ease their burdens and their lives, they found ways around the rules to do what they wanted anyway. But they still tried to enforce the rules on others. And that's why Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, says, Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaviness, heaven. Their holiness was false. It was a sanctimonious, self-seeking, worldly holiness. It was not honouring to God. So my message today, the application of this sermon, is simply that of the scriptures that we have read. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. As Christians, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We do not live holy lives by following rules. Instead, we follow the example of the Lord Jesus. We seek to become like him. In 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Paul says, 
follow my example. As I follow the example of Christ, it really is a conclusion to what Paul says in chapter 10, that we are to seek the good and the well-being of others, particularly their salvation. Thus, we are to walk in holiness and righteousness so that others will see Christ in us and seek after him. We need to be honest, though. God's holiness is such a high standard that we can never achieve it, despite what the early Methodists taught. We fight against our own sinful nature. But again, as Paul says in Ephesians 6, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. But this does not mean that we should not try to live in holiness. We rely, of course, on the help and the strength that the Holy Spirit gives us as he lives within us. But in our weaknesses and our failures, we can remember that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One, who pleads on our behalf. So let me end with this quote from John Newton. I am not what I ought to be. Ah, how imperfect and deficient. I am not what I would wish to be. I abhor what is evil, and I would cleave to what is good. I am not what I hope to be. Soon, soon I shall put off mortality, and with mortality all sin and imperfection. Yet, though I am not what I ought to be, nor what I wish to be, nor what I hope to be, I can truly say I am not what I once was, a slave to sin and Satan. I can heartily join with the Apostle and acknowledge, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I couldn't normally do this, but let me encourage you. This book, Holiness, by J.C. Ryle, was written 140 years or so ago. Um, and it's one of those books which is still so readily available. Uh, you probably wouldn't get a copy like looking like that, but there are literally dozens of different versions of this book available for about £5 on the internet. Let me encourage you, if you want something to read over the summer, buy a copy and read it. It'll be a great help to you.